Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Teresa Warner, and I am the 105th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through our programming and events such as these, while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the National Press Club, please visit our website at www.press.org. To donate to programs offered to the public through our National Press Club Journalism Institute, please visit press.org institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker and those of you attending today's event. Our head table includes guests of our speaker, as well as working journalists who are club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, we'd note that members of the general public are attending, so it is not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and our public radio audiences. Our luncheons are also featured on our member-produced weekly podcast from the National Press Club, available on iTunes. You can also follow the action on Twitter using hashtag NPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have a Q&A and I will ask as many questions as time permits. Now it's time to introduce our head table guest and I'd ask each of you here to stand up briefly as your name is announced. From your right, Eric Meltzer, Associated Press. Katie Steinmetz, Time Magazine. Kat Powers, Penn State student, and Thon 2013 overall public relations chairperson and a guest of our speaker. Jeff Ballou, Al Jazeera, and Penn State alumnus. Susan McHale, director, Social Science Research Institute, the Penn State University, and a guest of our speaker. Allison Fitzgerald, speaker committee chair and freelance journalist. I'm gonna skip our speaker for just a moment. Robert Carden, Carden Communications and Speakers Committee member who organized the luncheon and a Penn State alumnus. Kathy Bowen, Department of Agricultural and Economics, Sociology and Education professor in Consumer Issues, the Penn State University and a guest of our speaker. Jennifer Babich, Bureau Chief, Time Warner Cable. John Tamari, Philadelphia Inquirer. Robert Richards, the Pennsylvania State University Washington program. Thank you all for joining us today. <laughs> Penn State University is known as Happy Valley, and for good reason. It's a picture-perfect college town nestled amid the majestic hills of central Pennsylvania. An enormously popular university, it boasts the largest alumni association in the country. But things were anything but happy when our guest, Rodney Erickson, assumed the presidency of Penn State last November. The school was reeling from a child sex abuse scandal involving longtime Penn State assistant football coach, Jerry Sandusky. The coverage of the scandal was nonstop. The school's revered football coach, Joe Paterno, had just been fired, President Graham Spanier forced to step down, both men, along with others at Penn State, were accused with covering up the scandal to protect Penn State's reputation. This was the mess that Rodney Erickson inherited. That mess is slowly being cleaned up. Sandusky is in jail, probably for the rest of his life. The football program has been severely sanctioned by the NCAA, but has a new and popular coach, Bill O'Brien, who has brought stability to the program. The university was fined $60 million and is still likely on the hook for millions of more dollars as victims of Sandusky file civil suits against the school. A geography professor by trade, Dr. Erickson, has been at Penn State University since 1977. He has been chairman of the geography department and has served as executive vice president and provost of the university. Dr. Erickson graduated from the University of Minnesota and obtained his PhD in geography from the University of Washington. A native of Wisconsin, Dr. Erickson is the 17th president of Penn State and plans to step down in 2014. No doubt much of his time in the next two years will be dealing with the fallout from the scandal and restoring Penn State's reputation. 
Please join me in welcoming Rodney Erickson to the National Press Club. Well, good afternoon, and thank you, President Werner, for your kind introduction, as well as your flexibility rescheduling this event given the weather challenges of the week. I'm honored to be here, and I appreciate your interest in Penn State and higher education. A special welcome to all of the Penn Staters here, along with those of you covering educational issues. We need your continued engagement. Again, thank you for joining us, and thank you for bringing along the Penn State cookies. <laughs> According to Google News, there are over 45,000 stories about Penn State and Sandusky. You've written them, you've read them, and I imagine that most of you have formed an, an opinion about Penn State and our actions over the last year. But beyond the headlines, there's another reality, one that exists for Penn State's 96,000 students, 44,000 full and part-time faculty and staff, and over 550,000 living alumni. It's a world of teaching, research, and service. It's a world with an $800 million research program, hundreds of degrees offered, 24 campuses, an online world campus, an academic health center, a law school, and 157 years of tradition. It's also a world that has continued to face ongoing controversy surrounding Jerry Sandusky, our board of trustees, current and former administrators, and me. The legal process continues to unfold as evidenced by the Attorney General's further charges leveled yesterday. Today I want to tell you something about my world with the realities of running an institution the size and scope of Penn State while dealing with widely divergent perceptions. I want to share the many wonderful activities and accomplishments of our students and faculty and staff over this agonizing year. By any reasonable definition, they are newsworthy stories, but I understand that you may not be willing to listen to them until we show you how this year has changed us. What have we learned about ourselves, and what are we trying to do with that knowledge? I will speak candidly about how the last year has affected Penn State and how the impact has gone beyond central Pennsylvania to shape policies at colleges and universities across the nation. Then I'll share our strategies for the year ahead. To begin, let me take you back to last year when Penn State received the repugnant news that a former assistant coach had molested young boys, in some instances, on our campus. Immediately, as they did with all of you, our thoughts turned to the victims of these horrific crimes. And in the days that followed, we saw the removal of the senior leaders of our university and athletic program, including the popular president and iconic football coach. At the time, I was serving as the executive vice president and provost, a position I have often called the best job in higher education. My retirement was within my sights. When the Board of Trustees asked me to serve as president, I accepted, knowing full well that the months ahead would explore uncharted territory for our university. Many times I've been asked, why did you say yes? The answer has never changed. I've devoted 35 years of my professional life to Penn State. My children attended Penn State. And I believe deeply in our mission and in our ability to contribute to the greater good. I knew I needed to step up and serve. I also knew that Penn State is a great university, a great university that will endure at, as it has always endured, will recover, and will continue to advance teaching, research, and service. In those early weeks, I heard from Penn State's many constituents through more than 5,000 emails and letters and hundreds of phone calls and personal contacts. People were shocked, upset, concerned, disappointed, and yet supportive of the university. Meanwhile, as the story played out in the media, in alumni circles, and in every corner of our campuses, 
Voices that had remained silent for many years began to speak up. Victims of child abuse wrote to my office. These individuals were abused by family members and acquaintances. Indeed, only 10% of sexual abuse is perpetrated by a stranger. They were part of the chilling estimates. One in five girls and one in 10 boys are sexually abused by the age of 18. The majority of those victims will never tell anyone, even if they've been asked. The letters were powerful, expressing bottled up pain, shame, and struggles these individuals have lived with over many years. For some, this was the first time they had shared their story. Another has written regularly and met with some of my top administrators to collaborate on ways to help victims of child sexual abuse. I found these stories to be heartbreaking, but I also found hope in them. Those who wrote were entrusting their stories to us, and more importantly, they were looking to us to help tackle what is an insidious, hidden, and epidemic issue. They still believed in our capabilities even as we wrestled with our own despair about what had happened. Their issue became our issue, and we resolved to move forward by using all that is right about Penn State to take on this nationwide problem of child abuse. And we resolved to do it by doing what we do best, that is teaching, research, and service. Beyond that, we have something even more powerful, our student body. Within the first days of the crisis, it became clear that the students weren't going to wait for us to lead them. They were moving forward with unity and a constructive energy that's been inspiring to all of us. Here are just two quick examples. By the end of the first week, student leaders had organized a candlelight vigil on the old main lawn to show support for the victims of child sexual abuse. Thousands of Penn State students and community members joined together in the stillness of a cold, dark night to remind others that at the core of the issue we faced were children who had been gravely harmed. The following week, graduate students Laura March and, student Shapiro, and Stuart Shapiro helped mobilize the Penn State community with the goal of raising awareness and funds for combating child abuse. Working with a tight timeline line right before the Nittany Lions were to play their first football game in the aftermath of this tragedy, Laura and Stewart organized the first annual Blue Out to represent the color of ribbons worn in support of child abuse awareness. This year was the second annual Blue Out. Together, they raised $126,000 for Prevent Child Abuse Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. Laura and Stuart, please stand for a moment so we can recognize you. Thank you. Penn State alumni have also shown their support, raising nearly $550,000 for RAIN, the country's largest anti-sexual violence organization. Those are just a few examples of many acts large and small, that were organized and carried out by Penn Staters. What's more, students continue to respond to the crisis while still doing the things Penn State students have always loved to do. Study and learn, participate in clubs and activities, make friends, look forward to the future, and cheer on 800 plus student athletes in 31 varsity sports including a football team, I might add, whose performance on and off the field has made us proud. As administrators, we tried to balance the need to move ahead with the need to reflect on and correct the underlying issues that brought us to the crisis in the first place. The trustees began by asking former FBI Director Louis Free to lead an independent investigation, which yielded 119 recommendations on how to enhance our internal policies and practices. We've already implemented more than one third of these recommendations and many more are nearing completion. We remain committed to this progress because we believe it's making us a better, stronger university. And we're committed to the fight against child abuse. Central to this effort is the newly established 
Center for the Protection of Children, based at the Penn State Hershey Children's Hospital, and our ongoing partnership with the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. Earlier this week, we completed the first Penn State National Conference on Child Sexual Abuse. This forum brought together leaders and experts from law enforcement, pediatric medicine, prevention research, and education. We formed the Penn State Network for Child Protection and Well-Being, comprised of 35 faculty members with interdisciplinary expertise. The aim is to accelerate the pace of discovery by linking research and practice and to build the network with additional researchers, practitioners, and teachers. Dr. Susan McHale, director of the Social Science Research Institute and one of the co-organizers of the network is here with us today. Susan, can you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. We also made a pledge to educate our university community about ethics. It's one thing to know the rules, regulations, and policies. It's another thing to create a culture where every employee wants to do the right thing the first time, every time. Through training and awareness building efforts, we're trying to help people understand the how, when, where, and why of reporting. I assure you that Penn State takes this commitment very seriously. That's not a glib promise. To prove it, we have stepped up our efforts in compliance. Like most universities, Penn State has dozens of compliance professionals. They're responsible for ensuring research funds are appropriately used. They monitor our NCA compliance, our financial reporting, conformity to federal laws covering privacy rights and crime reporting, and they administer many more regulations related to the health, welfare, and safety of those on our campuses including our patients. What we've discovered, however, is that despite our staffing, there were gaps in the system, and we lacked a central compliance office where these efforts can be coordinated. We have since hired the university's first full-time compliance coordinator to ensure Penn State's overall compliance with the Cleary Act. With this new position, our goal is to not only ensure that Penn State meets the requirements set forth by federal law and the U.S. Department of Education, but to become a leader in campus safety, security, and compliance. Another example of the is the Athletics Integrity Agreement between the NCAA and Penn State, with oversight by Senator George Mitchell. This should help put the question of athletic integrity to rest, even as we implement changes. There is a great deal that is right about athletics at Penn State. Our student athletes graduate well above their peers nationwide. This year, they earned an 88% graduate success rate compared to 80% for all Division I schools. The football team's rate is 91%. This level of achievement spans all sports teams, academic majors, and ethnicity. Notably, African-American student athletes earned a record 90% rate, which is 25 points higher than the national average. Indeed, other universities are close, closely watching Penn State's actions so they can strengthen their policies, mitigate risk at their institutions, and make their campuses safer. States from California to Florida have introduced legislation to make it clear that child abuse reporting is not only a moral duty, it's the law. This is tremendous progress. Laws strengthened, policies tightened, governance revisited, and institutions made safer. And our work continues. That brings us to today. On the brink of the one-year anniversary, civil lawsuits, perjury trials, and we can expect more fallout to come. Over the last year, we have learned much about ourselves, our many cultures, our values, and our vision. We're still working through some difficult issues, but the question remains, where do we go from here? The answer can be found by returning to Penn State's core mission, teaching, research, and service. Our bottom line is delivering an outstanding education to students. Our students are our top priority. I repeat, our students are our top priority and they are doing great things. 
For example, this year, our journalism students captured the national championship in the William Randolph Hearst Foundation's Journalism Awards program. Engineering students took top honors in the national eco-car competition. Others are racing to get their vehicle to the moon in the Google Lunar X Prize competition. Meteorology students won the National Weather Forecasting Challenge. And notably this week, more than 3,400 Penn State meteorology alumni were tracking Hurricane Sandy for the government, private industry, the military, media, and education. In addition, this fall, we welcome one of the largest and most academically accomplished classes in our history after receiving a record 123,000 total applications for admission. These successes define who we are and where we're going. We need to support those students and faculty members because they depend on us. Our alumni and the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania depend on us for educational opportunities, economic development, and competitiveness. And our nation depends on us for groundbreaking research and training for the next generation of leaders, scientists, thinkers, and teachers. Allow me to put a few faces on the Penn State community. Will Kat Powers and Will Martin please stand? Kat and Will are student leaders working to fight pediatric cancer through the service to THON, the largest student-run philanthropy in the world. Since 1977, THON has raised more than $89 million for the Four Diamonds Fund at the Penn State Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. We brought along DVDs of the documentary, Why We Dance, the story of THON for all of you. So please pick up a copy on your way out. It's an incredible story. Thank you. Will and Kat. <laughs> Will Dr. Kathy Bowen please stand? Kathy is a professor of agricultural and extension education consumer issues. In addition to a full-time teaching and research agenda, she runs a volunteer service to help, help income eligible people get their taxes done for free. Last year, the program completed nearly 700 tax returns and saved the elderly, working families, and students at least $133,000. The program's total economic impact was nearly $1 million. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Finally, I want to introduce Dr. Sandeep Prabhu and Dr. Robert Paulson, who are both professors in our College of Agricultural Sciences. Could you please stand? Their inspiring collaboration discovered what could be a promising treatment for leukemia. In laboratory tests, the compound they developed targeted and killed leukemia stem cells without relapse. Their team, which includes undergraduate as well as graduate students, is now working to move this compound into clinical trials as soon as possible. Thank you, Bob and Sandeep. These are Penn Staters who are leading us into the future. They are the people I work for every day. They're the reason that I'm here today. And they are just a few of the Penn Staters who will not allow anything to stop them from changing our world for the better. With that in mind, I want to spend a few minutes looking ahead because we're currently facing a crisis in higher education that is perhaps the worst ever in our nation's history. Our young people from middle class and working families, people like Kat, Will, Laura, and Stuart, who for generations have depended on access to affordable community colleges and state universities. They're now at risk of losing that access. Throughout the nation, state governments are cutting back on the funding that helps keep tuition affordable. Uh, and uh, the threats cut in the cut, the th cuts threaten the system, excuse me, of public higher education that began when Abraham Lincoln signed the Morrill Land Grant Act 150 years ago. A report by the National Science Board released just last month found that state support for public universities fell 20% between 2002 and 2010. And this shortfall has put public research universities in peril. The declining investment in universities has made this a lost decade for funding and worse. It has happened while universities have increased enrollment by 320,000 students nationally. This has caused many to begin to question the future 
of public higher education and the implications for society. This is not a chicken little warning. And as a university president, I'm acutely aware that we need to adapt to today's economic realities. To be sure, state legislatures and governors have tough choices. Their ability to provide government services has decreased while the public's need for them has increased. And we know the difficulty of asking already hard-pressed Americans to pay higher taxes to subsidize public university tuition to enable lower and middle income families to afford to send their children to college. But we must address the current reality that our nation's public universities are charging tuitions that even in state students find increasingly out of their reach. Without a doubt, everyone in leadership at public universities can and must do a better job of reducing costs and improving education. Further belt tightening must occur on university campuses everywhere. Every member of the university community shares that responsibility. We at Penn State know this, and we're turning over every stone to find savings and efficiencies while improving learning outcomes. This year, we had the lowest tuition increase in 45 years. We have trimmed budgets, cut programs, and consolidated functions, but you can't do 21st century science in labs left over from the days of Sputnik or before. And as the CEO and psychologist Sean Acor has said, if we study what is merely average, we will remain merely average. Our students and our nation deserve better, and we must do better if we intend to compete in the global economy. Last year, I traveled to China and visited several universities. The national investment in these universities, their research facilities, and higher education is something to behold. Over the last 30 years, China has had a 58-fold increase in spending on education, health, and social investments. According to a report from the Center for American Progress, by 2030, China will have more than 200 million college graduates, which is more than the entire U.S. workforce. In five years, India will be producing five times as many college graduates as the United States. These are the facts that drive the decisions we must make as we position Penn State to succeed in the future. Part of that strategic planning will require getting out and staying out in front of the information technology revolution, which has been among the most significant drivers of educational change in the last 15 to 20 years. It's also been like a runaway train. One response to the higher education funding crisis has been increased appeals especially from legislators and business leaders, for higher education to drastically increase online education. The hope is that more students will receive college degrees faster and at less cost. In fact, research shows that, done appropriately, the application of technologies can both improve learning outcomes and decrease the costs of delivering that education. But so far, big savings have proven elusive. Nonetheless, Massive open online courses are testing the market. Dozens of universities, including MIT, Harvard, Princeton, and Stanford, now offer these classes, prompting headlines like, college may never be the same. So stay tuned. It could be a wild ride. Obviously, good ideas take time and research to explore. Penn State operates a world campus with nearly 12,000 students enrolled in dozens of fully online programs. Our model has been honored by the Sloan Consortium as the top online program for 2012. It too continues to evolve. Finally, in the coming year, we must prepare Penn State for the next generation of leadership. I announced that I will be retiring by June 2014, and the Board of Trustees is about to begin the search for the next president. It's incumbent upon us to lay the groundwork for my successor, and we look forward to an invigorating process with many outstanding candidates. Penn State continues to move forward and embrace the challenges, not only those that have come from the events of the past year, but those that come from being part of the higher education landscape, a large public land-grant research university, and yes, a university that continues to believe that great academics 
and great athletics can not only coexist, but can be mutually reinforcing components of a university education. I hope you can better understand why I'm proud to be president of our university. It's because of our students, faculty, staff, and hundreds of thousands of Penn State alumni and friends. Our difficulties are not over, but I assure you that Penn State's best days are still ahead. Again, thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. Thank you. The free report claims that Penn State officials, including former President Graham Spanier, were aware of and deliberately concealed Jerry Sandusky's abuse of children. You worked alongside the former president for 16 years. Do you truly believe that he was aware of and deliberately concealed Jerry Sandusky's abuse of children? I'm not uh, going to comment uh, on that because it is an ongoing investigation. It is the subject of, of continuing uh, litigation. But, uh, uh, you know, obviously, uh, all of us uh, at Penn State uh, have, have been uh, uh, deeply hurt, deeply moved uh, by everything that's, uh, that's transpired. Uh, yesterday was, uh, was certainly no exception uh, either, but uh, we have to trust the, uh, the courts now to, uh, to adjudicate these matters and uh, uh, allow our, our uh, legal process to, uh, to run its course. Chairwoman Karen Peets and the Penn State Board of Trustees have repeatedly said that Tim Curley and Gary Schultz will get their due process. Why was President Spanier not given the same consideration? In November of last year, the uh, board made uh, leadership changes. Uh, their uh, rationale for those uh, changes had been that um, uh, President Spanier uh, had not uh, uh, fulfilled his, uh, his leadership obligations uh, in subsequent uh, um, meetings with uh, the media. They indicated that uh, that was uh, primarily uh, around the issues of not keeping the, uh, the board uh, informed uh, about uh, developments that had occurred uh, over a long period of time, as well as uh, making uh, statements that were not uh, uh, in concert with the, uh, the board's wishes uh, in early November. Where are the Penn State Board of Trustee meeting minutes from November 9th, 2011, and why are they the only meeting minutes that have not been publicly released even after repeated requests and a legal requirement to do so? I wasn't there, obviously, so uh, I, I can't uh, answer that uh, with completeness, but uh, I have been told that uh, there are no minutes uh, that, were, that were taken at that meeting. What is the overlap in personnel between the Second Mile Board members, employees and donors, and that of Penn State Board of Trustees, employees and donors, and why were the conflicts of interest not identified in the free report? We uh, may be able to get you that uh, information, but I certainly don't have it. I was uh, never myself involved uh, in any way with the, uh, the second mile, uh, either in any of their fundraisers or, or any of their official activities. So uh, I, uh, I do not have a knowledge, uh, a working knowledge of who would have been back and forth uh, uh, with respect to uh, service uh, uh, of the university and service of the second mile. There have been widely reported contradictory quotations from members of your board of trustees as to the exact purpose of the Louis Free investigation and subsequent report. Can you please explain in detail how the scope of work was outlined for Free and the real purpose of his investigation and report? As I understand, Judge Free was, uh, was given a, uh, a broad mandate to um, uh, look uh, at the Sandusky situation. Uh, to try to discern uh, what had happened, what had gone wrong, and uh, beyond that, to uh, make uh, recommendations on how the uh, university could improve its, uh, its policies, practices, and operations. Uh, as I indicated uh, in my remarks, uh, Judge Free, um, 
identified 119 recommendations. Uh, indeed, many of these, I'm sure, were suggested by the more than 400 individuals that uh, Judge Free's team uh, interviewed over the course of, of several months. Uh, we have focused uh, as an administration on putting uh, as many of those uh, recommendations uh, uh, and, and really the, the idea is to put them all into place as quickly as possible. The board has responded, uh, uh, responded very quickly to the recommendations and has also taken a number of actions uh, since last November, uh, including uh, changing uh, of the board leadership, uh, completely revising the committee structure, creating uh, six committees that are very responsive to the current uh, functions and needs of the university. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of uh, work that's going on. I've appointed three of my se senior leaders to uh, implement, uh, to oversee the implementation of the recommendations of the, uh, the free report. So we've made a tremendous amount of progress. We continue to with the goal of having uh, all of the recommendations completed by the end of calendar 2013. A follow-up question to the board. Uh, all meetings are recorded. Why was the November meeting an exception? Again, I wasn't there. I, I uh, simply have no knowledge of that. Have you asked? <laughs> uh, plenty of other people have asked. But, uh, have but, but uh, I was simply told, yes, uh, I asked, and uh, I was told that there were no meetings that were minutes of that meeting that were kept. Did you ask why? Yes, I asked why, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the actions uh, that were taken there, I think, uh, uh, were uh, the subject of that, that board meeting. And uh, again, I, I can't uh, respond to questions that, that I wasn't there or don't have information about. How do you address the fears, concerns of alumni that felt that Penn State seemingly giving in to the NCAA sanctions without dispute feeds into the storyline that Penn State had a culture where football was put above all else? Well, first of all, let me say that, uh, that uh, accepting the NCAA consent decree was the, the most difficult question, the most difficult decision I've had to make in, in 40 years now uh, of a professional career. Um, I've laid out the, uh, the reasons uh, in public why I made those decisions, but uh, clearly the, the alternative, which was, uh, was multiple years of, of the death penalty, uh, I simply felt was, uh, was too devastating uh, for the, uh, the university, uh, the community, and I thought that uh, e even though the, uh, the sanctions that were imposed were, were unprecedented, and crippling in many ways. Um, it was uh, the better alternative and also allowed us to, uh, to move forward uh, as a university. Uh, so I made that decision and I stand by that decision. Did you personally sign the retirement package for Jerry Sandusky that gave him access to the Penn State campus? Uh, no, I did not. Uh, the only role that I played there was uh, as provost uh, the president uh, awards or chooses not to award emeritus status. Uh, in 1999, when uh, uh, Jerry Sandusky was awarded emeritus status, the policy was, uh, in essence, nothing more than uh, a title. And uh, the, uh, the concerns that I expressed uh, about that in, email, in an email that was uh, produced in the free report uh, was uh, only concerned with the, uh, the precedent that might set of someone who was at the assistant professor rank uh, who would be given emeritus status. Uh, but I played no role in, uh, in, in any of the, uh, uh, the, the kinds of uh, um, matters related to what uh, Mr. Sandusky uh, was entitled to as, as an emeritus uh, member of the uh, faculty and staff. Uh, I had no role in that whatsoever, nor did I see the document. With the benefit of hindsight, after the 1998 investigation was completed by CYS, Department of Public Welfare, the Center County DA and police staff, and Jerry Sandusky was not charged with any crimes, what should Penn State have done differently regarding his access to PSU facilities? Well, clearly there, there should have been uh, additional follow-up. Um, we know that, 
And uh, uh, that's really why we've done so much over the course of the last year to put the kinds of policies into place that we have. Uh, we have uh, uh, secured facilities uh, in new ways. We have uh, changed the, uh, the ways in which uh, retired uh, faculty and staff have uh, access to our facilities. We've um, uh, implemented background checking for not only our own faculty and staff, but people, uh, our volunteers who are coming on to campus for, for uh, many, many reasons. We've uh, strengthened our mandatory uh, reporting laws, uh, our procedures related to the Cleary Act, and uh, certainly within uh, our police services, our investigative services, we've strengthened all of those, uh, uh, those processes and procedures that uh, uh, in the future we believe uh, will uh, uh, make it uh, very unlikely that this sort of thing could ever happen again. In light of the transparency that you have promised, will you be releasing a copy of the $6.5 million contract that authorized the free group to do their investigation? That's a, a decision for the board, um, and uh, uh, that, that's something that should be directed toward the, uh, the chair of the board. Four Penn State trustees were named in the free report for having prior knowledge of the Sandusky grand jury investigation dating back to the spring of 2011 and doing nothing about it. Only one of those trustees, Steve Garbin, has so far resigned. Why are Jim Broadhurst, John Surma, and Edward Hintz still holding their trustee positions? Well, again, that would be a question that would be best directed to them. But I would have to say that... Uh, the, uh, the board has made uh, very, very significant changes over the, uh, the course of the past year. I, I mentioned uh, uh, many of the changes that they have made to their structure. Uh, I would also say that uh, the oversight of the board has, uh, has increased uh, dramatically. Uh, as I said, there's new leadership. And uh, I have uh, regular contact uh, uh, virtually on a daily basis with the uh, leadership of our board. I think other members of our board uh, uh, feel uh, very much uh, empowered to reach uh, into the ranks of my senior staff to uh, request information, to raise issues. Uh, it's really a, a very different kind of uh, oversight environment that I think uh, will serve the university very well. Many of the pitfalls of the previous administration and the Board of Trustees at the time were due to poor communications and accountability between the office of the president and the leaders of the board. How have the free recommendations and lessons learned improved that communication? And what processes have been instilled to help ensure that both groups of leaders are fully aware of what each is doing? I think I addressed uh, much of that in my, my last response. But it, uh, it has been uh, uh, a year of much more frequent uh, meetings, uh, uh, much enhanced interactions. The board is uh, fully aware and uh, very well briefed of uh, any major issues that are taking place uh, at the university. And I would also say that, uh, that one of the, the, uh, the objectives in, in my administration has been to create more interaction among my senior leadership team so that uh, whenever any issues come before the university that come around our table, uh, we're discussing them in the, uh, the broad group of about 18 members who, uh, who make up part of my president, who make up my president's council. The free report concluded that Graham Spanier, Joe Paterno, Tim Curley, and Gary Schultz intentionally covered up their knowledge of Sandusky's child abuse to protect the reputation of the Penn State football program. On what grounds do you think Louis Free reached this conclusion, and do you think it's fair and accurate? That's a question that, uh, that's best directed uh, to Louis Free, uh, and certainly the, uh, the legal process that's going on that's continuing, uh, and the investigation that's continuing will uh, uh, hopefully lead to some conclusions with, that, with respect to that question. Did the university consult with legal counsel to determine how accepting the free conclusion about the evidence might be looked upon as admission of guilt and expose the university to greater liability in victim civil suits against the university? The, uh, the university uh, certainly uh, thought about that. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the, the free report was commissioned by uh, the Board of Trustees. 
and uh, the uh, Board of Trustees accepted that report, uh, I would say that that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, members of the Board of Trustees uh, agree with every aspect of the report, but we certainly agree with the, uh, the recommendations of the report and, uh, and are moving ahead uh, very swiftly to, make, to uh, implement those recommendations. Who first suggested the use of the death penalty as an appropriate penalty handed down from the NCAA? You or Mark Emmert? Mark Emmert. In your opinion, what possibly could have been uncovered in an NCAA investigation of Penn State that would have netted a worse result than the current sanctions? Well, I don't know uh, what, uh, what kinds of other issues uh, there, there may have been, but uh, I can't imagine a worse outcome than uh, the death sentence, uh, the death penalty, uh, or, or, and, and multiple years of, of that. Uh, you have to understand that um, uh, the death penalty would have uh, uh, not only erased uh, a, a tremendous uh, source of revenue f that helps to support all of our intercollegiate athletic programs, but we would have had uh, years of continuing costs given all of the contracts and, uh, uh, and, and all of the uh, commitments that we had related to, uh, to football. Uh, the loss of television revenue, of course, would be, uh, be very, very substantial as well. Uh, the uh, impacts on the local community uh, which uh, over the course of seven games are, are absolutely huge in a small community like ours. And, uh, and certainly the, uh, uh, the sanctions that we accepted, uh, unprecedented and, uh, and, and uh, severe as they were, uh, still allowed us to continue to play. And uh, uh, I, I have to say how proud I am of our our football players. Uh, these men, young men have, uh, have stuck with us. Uh, they have, uh, for the most part, over 90% of them have stayed with Coach O'Brien and the staff. Uh, they have played their hearts out during the fall, and I believe they will continue to. They have uh, really acted like the true champions that they are. Uh, I don't care what their one-loss record is, uh, they're champions as far as I'm concerned. And uh, they, they reflect how we will get through this process. Uh, we, we will come out uh, stronger in, in the end. Who proposed the final version of the sanctions, Penn State or the NCAA? We had uh, little that we were able to uh, um, negotiate, uh, if you will, in terms of the, uh, the NCAA sanctions. Uh, we were not in a negotiating position, and uh, the NCA had, uh, had made that uh, uh, very clear to us. Did you brief the trustees about the negotiations with Mark Emmert? Yes, I brought the uh, executive committee of the board uh, into the loop uh, early on that week and uh, kept them informed through the process, uh, including... Uh, uh, Sunday night at the latest uh, before I put pen to paper to sign it. What role could the legacy of Joe Paterno play in Penn State's future? Is there a scenario where Coach Paterno's legacy is restored? This is, uh, is, is certainly a, an issue that has, uh, has great importance for the university community. Uh, Joe Paterno was, uh, was a larger-than-life figure for much of his 61 years at Penn State and uh, certainly left a, uh, an important uh, legacy for the university. Uh, I uh, certainly, uh, in, in uh, making decisions that I did, uh, I uh, thought it was most appropriate that we leave uh, the Paterno name on the library uh, given the contributions to education, the many contributions to education that that uh, Coach Paterno and uh, and his family uh, had made uh, over the years, uh, I think that's a um, a, a very very uh, fitting tribute uh, to have that name yet on the library. Uh, as to to how the uh, the university uh, would uh, would entertain uh, other ideas, I think that's something that we'll we'll have to give it. Uh, some time, 
Uh, there are uh, uh, lots of different, differing opinions uh, about this, and I hope uh, at some point we'll, uh, we'll be able to address that uh, with, with a sense of, uh, of unity and reflection. How do you think alumni have reacted to the steps the university has taken to repair and limit the damage to the image and reputation of their alma mater? I think there are, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, different, different thoughts uh, out there. Um, it, uh, it clearly has been, been difficult to, uh, to move the positive forward uh, when we've had uh, what seems like a, a continuing uh, uh, stream of, um, of, of bad news that's, uh, that's come out uh, over the course of the last year. But uh, we are moving forward uh, with the help of individuals uh, such as I introduced you today. And uh, we, we need to continue to do that. We need to, uh, to talk about the, uh, the, the wonderful, uh, tremendously positive things that are happening at Penn State day in and day out. Uh, because our, our mission has not changed one iota over the last year. It's, we're still about teaching research and service. Uh, we're still the great educational institution that we were a year ago. Uh, we're still the place that, uh, that cor corporate America most likes to come to hire graduates. Uh, all of these things are there. All of them are still in place. So we can't forget that even as we, uh, as we uh, deal with, uh, with, with some of the issues that, uh, that continue to arise. What was the reaction on campus yesterday to Graham Spanier's charges? I uh, had uh, relatively few opportunities to, uh, to interact uh, with uh, individuals during the day in, in a kind of an informal uh, uh, discussion atmosphere. Um, you know, I, I'm sure that, uh, that there was uh, uh, emotion, there was a, a lot of uh, concern. Uh, Dr. Spanier was, uh, was very well regarded uh, among the student body and, and certainly among the, the, uh, the faculty. Uh, so I, I think we'll, uh, we'll have a, a better opportunity to assess that uh, over the, uh, the next few days and, and the weeks ahead. Given the new charges, are you being investigated for any role in the Sandusky scandal? Not that I'm aware of. How is settlement negotiation going, and why has the university not been forthcoming about how much it is paying Feinberg Rosen, the settlement negotiators? Uh, Ken Feinberg and, uh, and, and Mike Rosen uh, were brought on really as, uh, as intermediaries. They don't uh, uh, represent the university. They don't represent victims. Uh, they're simply there to try to engage a discussion and hopefully uh, develop a process that uh, both the, uh, the university, uh, our insurance carriers, and the, uh, the plaintiffs can, uh, can get together around. Uh, ideally, we would like to, uh, to, saw, to uh, settle all of the, uh, the cases if it were possible, but uh, even some number of them, if we could settle them without uh, taking uh, the victims through, uh, through a, uh, a litigation process, that would be uh, very preferable uh, for everyone, I believe. And uh, they will, will continue to try to move this process forward uh, over the uh, next few weeks, over the next few months, uh, and hopefully it will help us to uh, bring some resolution to the matter uh, uh, in, in a timely uh, and, and just manner. What is the status of the universe, university's fight with one of its insurers, Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association Insurance Company, over general liability coverage? The, uh, the issue there really is, uh, is about whether they're going to provide coverage, but let me first uh, give you a little background here. Uh, like uh, other organizations of our, our size and scope, like our peer universities, we have multiple stacks of, uh, of coverage. The, uh, the, the layer from the, uh, uh, that you're referring to uh, is, is simply the first layer in coverage that we've had and maintained for about 60 years. Uh, none of the subsequent uh, coverage is dependent upon what happens with that layer. 
What would be the university's response if Curly, Schultz, and Spaniards are found not guilty of the charge of endangering the welfare of children and failure to report child abuse? Because isn't that what the sanctions are largely based on? Well, we'll have to, uh, to wait and see how, how all of this, uh, this turns out. I'm, I'm not going to speculate uh, on, on those kinds of what-if situations at this point. Okay, we have just a couple more minutes, so I have a few announcements to make before we get to our last question. First of all, I'd like to remind you all of our upcoming luncheons on November 12th. We have Roger Daltrey, lead singer of The Who, will discuss the UCLA Daltrey Towson Teen and Young Adult Cancer Program. On November 16th, Admiral Jonathan Greener, Chief of Naval Operations, will be speaking. Secondly, I'd like to present our guest with the traditional National Press Club coffee mug. Makes all those beverages taste better. And lastly, I'd like to ask, what is your one major goal that you would like to accomplish before you leave your role in two years? My major goal is, is really to um, set the stage for, for my successor so that she or he uh, can come in and, uh, and really take the reins of uh, uh, this great university that is Penn State, continue to, uh, to drive us forward to do wonderful things. Uh, and um, uh, my goal is, uh, is really to, to make that happen and uh, continue to, to serve uh, our faculty, staff, students, and alumni in the best possible way I can during the time I have left. Thank you. How about a round of applause for our speakers today? Thank you for coming. I'd also like to thank the National Press Club staff, including its Journalism Institute and Broadcast Center for organizing today's event. Finally, here's a reminder that you can find more information about the National Press Club on our website. Also, if you would like to get a copy of today's program, please check out our website at www.press.org. Thank you, we are adjourned. Reputation. Please join me in welcoming Rodney Erickson to the National Press Club. Well, good afternoon, and thank you, President Werner, for your kind introduction, as well as your flexibility rescheduling this event given the weather challenges of the week. I'm honored to be here, and I appreciate your interest in Penn State and higher education. A special welcome to all of the Penn Staters here, along with those of you covering educational issues. We need your continued engagement. Again, thank you for joining us, and thank you for bringing along the Penn State cookies. <laughs> According to Google News, there are over 45,000 stories about Penn State and Sandusky. You've written them, you've read them, and I imagine that most of you have formed an, an opinion about Penn State and our actions over the last year. But beyond the headlines, there's another reality, one that exists for Penn State's 96,000 students. Others at Penn State were accused with covering up the scandal to protect Penn State's reputation. This was the mess that Rodney Erickson inherited. That mess is slowly being cleaned up. Sandusky is in jail, probably for the rest of his life. The football program has been severely sanctioned by the NCAA, but has a new and popular coach, Bill O'Brien, who has brought stability to the program. The university was fined $60 million and is still likely on the hook for millions of more dollars as victims of Sandusky file civil suits against the school. A geography professor by trade, Dr. Erickson, has been at Penn State University since 1977. He has been chairman of the geography department and has served as executive vice president and provost of the university. Dr. Erickson graduated from the University of Minnesota and obtained his PhD in geography from the University of Washington. A native of Wisconsin, Dr. Erickson is the 17th president of Penn State and plans to step down in 2014. 
No doubt much of his time in the next two years will be dealing with the fallout from the scandal and restoring Penn State's also featured on our member-produced weekly podcast from the National Press Club, available on iTunes. You can also follow the action on Twitter using hashtag NPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have a Q&A and I will ask as many questions as time permits. Now it's time to introduce our head table guest and I'd ask each of you here to stand up briefly as your name is announced. From your right, Eric Meltzer, Associated Press, Katie Steinmetz, Time Magazine, Kat Powers, Penn State student, and Thon 2013 overall public relations chairperson and a guest of our speaker. Jeff Ballou, Al Jazeera, and Penn State alumnus. Susan McHale, director, Social Science Research Institute, the Penn State University, and a guest of our speaker. Allison Fitzgerald, speaker committee chair and freelance journalist. I'm gonna skip our speaker for just a moment. Robert Carden, Carden Communications and Speakers Committee member who organized the luncheon and a Penn State alumnus. Kathy Bowen, Department of Agri- Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Teresa Warner and I am the 105th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through our programming and events such as these, while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the National Press Club, please visit our website at www.press.org. To donate to programs offered to the public through our National Press Club Journalism Institute, please visit press.org institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker and those of you attending today's event. Our head table includes guests of our speaker, as well as working journalists who are club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, we'd note that members of the general public are attending, so it is not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and our public radio audiences. Our luncheons are cultural and economics, sociology and education professor and consumer issues, the Penn State University and a guest of our speaker. Jennifer Babich, Bureau Chief, Time Warner Cable. John Tamari, Philadelphia Inquirer. Robert Richards, the Pennsylvania State University Washington Program. Thank you all for joining us today. Penn State University is known as Happy Valley, and for good reason. It's a picture-perfect college town nestled amid the majestic hills of central Pennsylvania. An enormously popular university, it boasts the largest alumni association in the country. But things were anything but happy when our guest, Rodney Erickson, assumed the presidency of Penn State last November. The school was reeling from a child sex abuse scandal involving longtime Penn State assistant football coach Jerry Sandusky. The coverage of the scandal was nonstop. The school's revered football coach, Joe Paterno, had just been fired, President Graham Spanier forced to step down. Both men, along 